Welcome to lesson 7 in our fables unit and today we're going to be talking about morals in fables. Now one of the most important characteristics of a fable is that it must have a moral. Now in order to determine the moral we have to ask ourselves what lesson is this fable trying to teach us? The way that we can also figure out the moral is by using the actions of the bad character or the good character, or both, to figure out what we're trying to learn from the fable. So I'm going to read The Boy Who Cried Lunch Monitor, and we're going to think about what the main character is, whether they had a foible or a positive characteristic, whether they had a conflict or a triumph in the story, and what the moral of the story was. The Boy Who Cried Lunch Monitor Mrs. Buns ruled Aesop Elementary's lunchroom with an iron fist. No kid dared to blow bubbles in his milk or slurp her spaghetti or stick a straw up his nose. Because if one of them did, Lunchroom infraction! Mrs. Buns would bellow through her, through her bullhorn. Five minutes on the wall! On the wall. Those three words struck fear into the heart of every student at Aesop Elementary, first graders and fifth graders alike. On the wall. It was Mrs. Bunn's favorite punishment, a form of torture so horrible that anyone who endured it never again left his bread crusts uneaten or chewed with her mouth open. Still, at the beginning of every school year, there was always one kid foolish enough to tangle with big, bad buns. You know what I'm having for lunch, that kid might holler. And before anyone could warn her, she would open her mouth wide so everyone could see the glob of half-chewed bologna with mustard and pickle relish on pumpernickel lurking inside, and she would squeal, SEAFOOD! The lunch monitor's vengeance was swift. LUNCHROOM INFRACTION! Mrs. Buns would bellow. Five minutes on the wall! The other students would shudder. Mrs. Buns made the kid face the room with her back to the cold, tiled wall. I think you have something to say to your schoolmates, she would growl. Huh? The kid always looked bewildered. An apology, Mrs. Buns would continue. You owe us all an apology. No one could bear to watch. One hundred elementary school students would quickly look down at their carrot sticks or stare at their orange slices. I... I don't understand. The kid was always red-faced and stammering by this time. Waves of humiliation were washing over her. She was drowning in them. That was when Mrs. Buns would pull the note card from her pocket. Yellowed with age and wrinkled from much use, it had through the years been held in the quaking hands of dozens of students. Now it was this kid's turn. Read it, Mrs. Buns would say. The kid recognized defeat. In a small, quavering voice, so unlike the voice that only moments earlier had shouted seafood, she read, I apologize for my rudeness and promise to use my best table manners the next time I sit down to lunch. Thank you, Mrs. Buns would say. Then she'd walk away, leaving the kid it to simmer in her own embarrassment for five long minutes on the wall. No wonder the children in Aesop Elementary's lunchroom sat up straight, ate in silence, and cleaned up all their trash. But, asked Mr. Jupiter one day as he bit into the cook's liverwurst and cranberry sauce sandwich, are the children happy? Do they enjoy lunchtime? Ha! Lunchtime isn't about enjoyment, Mrs. Buns replied. It's about discipline and maintaining order. At that moment, Mrs. Struggles raced into the lunchroom. Bertha, come quick, she panted. There's a traffic jam in the kindergarten drop-off lane. I need you and your bullhorn to untangle it. I'm on my way, cried Mrs. Buns. She rushed from the lunchroom, and Mr. Jupiter followed. Left unmonitored, the students sat in silence for a moment. Then, Rose cautiously leaned over and whispered in Missy's ear. Emberly quietly offered Ham a chocolate chip cookie, and Lenny glanced furtively around the lunchroom. Then he took a big swig of his Mr. Fizz and... Burp! The doors of restraint were belched wide open. Jackie wildly pitched cheesy puffs into Calvin's open mouth, 
Ashley A, Ashley B, and Ashley Z put their mashed potatoes together and built a snowman. Amisha gargled with chocolate milk. And the only fourth grader not laughing or talking or joining in the fun was Melvin Moody. Melvin was used to not joining in. He was used to not being part of the group. Somehow in Mr. Jupiter's class, Melvin always managed to blurt out the wrong thing or pick his nose when someone was looking or fumble the ball at recess and lose the championship kickball game. This kind of behavior tended to keep other kids away. Now Melvin was suddenly seized with an uncontrollable urge. Leaping to his feet, he cupped his hands around his mouth and cried, Lunch monitor! Lunch monitor! Fear swept through the room. Pretzels were yanked from nostrils, bread crusts were swallowed whole, the entire student body smoothed their hair, sat up straight, and hoped their cheeks weren't too flushed with joy. A minute passed. Then another. And another. She's not coming, Victoria finally said. Lenny whirled on Melvin. You did it, he shouted. You ruined the fun. All eyes turned to Melvin. Jackie booed. Rachel and Lil stuck out their tongues. Bruce threw a banana peel, and it hit Melvin in the back of the head. But Melvin loved it. I'm the center of attention, he thought. He held his chin up high. For days afterwards, Melvin felt like a celebrity. There's that kid from the lunchroom, whispered Bernadette. What a loser, whispered Ham. What's his name again? asked Lil. The other shrugged. All too soon, however, Melvin's celebrity faded. By week's end, he was nobody again. But that was when Miss Turner wobbled into the lunchroom. Bertha, said Miss Turner, you've got a phone call in the office. I'm busy, grumbled Mrs. Buns. Eyes narrowed, she plucked a recyclable can from the regular trash, then looked around for the rule breaker. But it's your mother, the Marine, said Miss Turner. She's calling from boot camp. Mrs. Buns hesitated, then dropped the can into the recycling bin and headed for the office. Miss Turner and Mr. Jupiter followed. Once again, the lunchroom was left unmonitored. Within seconds, first graders crawled under tables, second graders squeezed the cream filling out of their cupcakes, third graders blew bits of fruit cocktail from their straws, as for the fourth graders, they raced their sandwich cookies down the length of the table. And Oreo takes the lead, said Jackie in her sports announcer voice, followed by High Drops and Girl Scout. Then, lunch monitor, lunch monitor, Melvin cried. Quick as a wink, straws were stuck back into milk cartons. Sandwich cookies were popped into mouths, flushed and panting. Everyone braced themselves for nothing. Not again moaned Calvin. He whirled on Melvin. What's your problem, kid? But Melvin didn't have a problem, because once again, in the days that followed, he was talked about, recognized, somebody. Fame was fleeting. By the middle of the following week, Melvin was as forgotten as last month's vocabulary words. That was when, during lunch, crash! Arrgh! Mayday! cried Mrs. Shorthand, who had been standing on a swivel chair and hanging a sign in the hallway. Mayday! Mrs. Buns rushed to help her. Left in the lunchroom, the students didn't waste a second. Everyone laughed or joked or blew milk out their nose. At the fourth grade table, Jackie had invented a game called Flick Your Pea, and everyone was playing. Everyone, that is, except Melvin. Then he saw her, Mrs. Buns, coming down the hallway closer and closer. Lunch monitor! Lunch monitor! he cried. Yeah, right, drawled Lenny. He flicked a pea into Missy's applesauce. Mrs. Buns reached the door. Melvin hopped up and down. He waved his arms. He cried even more loudly. Lunch monitor! Lunch monitor! Knock it off, kid, said Calvin. Nobody believes you. He aimed a pea at Stanford. Mrs. Buns pushed on the wide swinging doors. Panicked and desperate, Melvin leaped onto the fourth grade table, hopped up and down, waved his arms, and cried at the top of his voice, Lunch monitor! Lunch monitor! His behavior finally grabbed their attention. Everyone stopped joking and laughing and flicking peas. They all turned to look at Melvin just as Mrs. Buns burst into the lunchroom. 
Launch room in fraction! She bellowed through her bullhorn. Her eyes narrowed at the sight of Melvin, who was still hopping, waving, and shouting on top of the table. Unbelievable, she said. I'm gone just a few moments and look how you behave. Melvin Moody, that's five minutes on the wall. Now, if we think about what happened in this story, we can see that our main character in this story was Melvin. Now, Melvin really wanted the attention of his fellow classmates. Oftentimes, he got a little bit ignored or overlooked. He didn't really like that. Now, when Mrs. Buns and the other teachers left the lunchroom, all of the kids went nuts. They started doing things they shouldn't do. They started throwing things and spitting out milk and hitting each other with juice from their juice boxes. And Melvin saw it as a chance to get attention, and he jumped onto one of the tables and yelled lunch monitor when Mrs. Buns really wasn't coming back. He did this a few times, and by the end of the story, when he really meant that the lunch monitor was coming, nobody believed him when it counted. Now, we know that because Melvin was doing things that were wrong, he has a foible because a foible is a negative character trait. Now, one of Melvin's main negative character traits in this particular fable is that he was being a liar. He was not telling the truth about what was happening with the lunch monitor coming back into the room. Now, this led to a conflict because, number one, the other kids were not happy with Melvin, and they didn't like that he was being annoying. So the other kids were annoyed with Melvin. The second thing is that nobody believed him because he was being a liar. And when somebody lies over and over again, it's very hard to know that you can trust them. Now, if we think about the moral of this story, this story sounds a lot like the boy who cried wolf. And if we think about what we learned in this story, we learned that even when you tell the truth, if you've been a liar in the past, a lot of times people won't believe you. And so our moral to this story is that liars are not believed even when they tell the truth. Which means that we should always tell the truth so that when it counts, people will be able to trust us and know that we're telling them the right thing. And that was Fables Lesson 7, Morals in Fables.